Before we uh, get started to introducing our speaker, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on. So I just ask for you to take a couple of deep breaths. Center yourselves in this moment, in this time, in this place. Feel your feet on the ground. Acknowledge your rootedness to the land. We gather here on the ancestral land of the Lekwungen-speaking people, particularly the Shkonin family group. Um, this was an area, a village area, where uh, blue camas was harvested, where cultural and spiritual traditions thrived for thousands of years before white settlers arrived. I want to acknowledge those first peoples who lived on this land in harmony with this land and also acknowledge the grave injustices that settlers have done to the first peoples and acknowledge that we here in this community and all the Anglican Church are seeking to live into an authentic reconciliation with first peoples so that we can live together in a true harmony that respects the dignity of every individual and also respects the gift of the land. I'm going to offer a prayer to get us started. Holy One, we give thanks for the beauty of your creation, for the freshness of the air, for the beauty of the land and all the things that grow on it, for the life within the sea. And we ask you to be with us and help us to honor your beautiful creation. We ask for you to be present to us, to inspire us, to help us be workers of justice for all those people who are suffering from injustice and also for our creation, that the generations that come after us might also be able to behold the beauty that we so appreciate. Amen. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Dr. John Thetominal is Associate Professor of Theology and World Religions at Union Seminary in New York. He happened to be on sabbatical, so I swept him up for this program. Um, uh, Dr. Thetominal has taught a wide variety of courses at Union in comparative theologies and religious diver diversity and interreligious dialogue in the theology of Paul Tillich and process theology, and most recently in eco-theology, which he's gonna speak about today. He's the author of a book titled The Eminent Divine God Creation and the Human Predicament, an East-West Conversation. Uh, he has another book coming out uh, next spring that's um, entitled Circling the Elephant, a Comparative Theology of Religious Diversity. Um, and I know he's working on a third book while he's on a uh, sabbatical, so he is very busy uh, writing and thinking and reflecting. Tatamino also routinely works to bring theology into the public square, which I think is really important. Uh, writing op-eds, writing blog posts, um, helping uh, all of us really to do theological thinking for ourselves. Uh, in a blog post he wrote with his wife, Kate Newman, uh, that was written earlier this year, uh, he wrote this, and I thought I would uh, share it with you. It's a piece that is about the relationship between personal transformation and sort of collective transformation and how we can work together in the situation we find ourselves in in the ecological crisis. He writes, Personal transformation must find collective expression in the quest for social and ecological justice. We can live into 2019 confident that robust transformation, personal and political, is possible only if we commit ourselves simultaneously to the personal labor of self-crafting and the messy public work of activism. The alternative, in any case, is self-fulfilling defeatism. No change can happen when you believe no change can happen. So 
uh, he is here to help us believe together that change can happen and to help us think through how we uh, can be people who are living that change out into the world for the better. So thank you, John. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. And uh, I've been here now for uh, long enough to actually have some friends in the audience. So it's beginning to feel uh, a, a bit more like community. Um, so thank you for, for having me, Elizabeth. That introduction should already have sufficed to alert you to an important fact that you need to know, namely that eco-theology is not my primary area of research expertise. You'll notice that all the books I'm writing are about interreligious matters. So um, my, that's my day job. Um, but the person at Union who used to teach eco-theology retired he occasionally comes back as an emeritus professor and teaches. Um, but it seemed to me ridiculous that in this age of uh, climate crisis, that there would be a program at a um, established seminary like Union in which no one was taking up the, the, the work of thinking about eco-theology and the climate crisis. And uh, with trepidation, I, I ventured in. That means that you and I are not very far removed in terms of levels of expertise on this matter. Uh, we'll, we'll therefore think together about learning to think well about what it means to live in a time of climate crisis. Now, I don't know how many of you are comfortable to begin with with the word theology <laughs> as such. Um, I'm not even sure how to assess that, but um, do people read in theology here? Okay. Oh, well, wow, okay. A fair number of people whose hands went up, but about half, uh, I would say, and half are perhaps newbies. So the word itself requires some attention before we stick the prefix eco on it, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Now, Many people think of theology as, as a kind of finished thing, that somewhere in the past there exist authoritative statements, proclamations, creedal, creedal statements and the like that tell us what we ought to think about God. So the idea that theology is something that is unfinished and ever unfolding is itself um, not something that people ponder, right? Why don't we just, you know, receive from the distant past some finished proclamations? Wouldn't that do? If so, then the contemporary theologian would just be a kind of translator, right? Certain notions were expressed in antique language that no longer makes sense to us. And the job of the theologian is merely that of translation. All the work has already been done in the past. Uh, the really important work and the, um, the contemporary theologian is a glorified translator. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what theological thinking is. The word itself, you know, is a compound of two Greek words, theos and logos, word or words or reason or discourse about God. <clears throat> That's what the word uh, at, a, at a rudimentary level means. But theology more capaciously understood is disciplined reflection about the meaning of faith for human life. Life lived before God. Disciplined reflection about the meaning of faith for human life. Life as it's lived before God. Sometimes it's described as faith-seeking understanding. That is the, uh, the most classical expression, Anselm, fides quorens intellectum, faith-seeking understanding. That works for me, but I think already that can signal why theology is always an unfinished project, right? Because we seek, to un we seek understanding in our time from the concrete situations 
that shape and give meaning to our lives. Theology is the work of seeking orientation. I would say it's the quest for compre- what I would call comprehensive qualitative orientation. What does it feel like to be here? Where here is everything. Right? The whole cosmic uh, situation of human life. You and I move into a new neighborhood or are thinking about moving into a new neighborhood, we typically ask questions about, well, is this place uh, safe? Is this a place where I can make a home? Um, Will I settle down here, establish roots, find uh, community? We we take an assessment of the kind of placement we'll, 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 we'll engage in when we are in the new neighborhood. Or we might say, no, this is just a place we're passing through. It's not really a, a place we're going to put down roots. This is a temporary abode. Right? You see how those kinds of questions are asked about a neighborhood. Well, now imagine asking those questions about the neighborhood. <laughs> the, the whole show, right? That's what I mean about Um, seeking orientation or a comprehensive qualitative orientation. Where are we? Why are we here? What is a worthy life? What is worth desiring? All of those questions are theological questions. All of those. That means also, of course, that all manner of people who are in no way thinking of themselves as theologians are thinking about those questions. Does that make sense? So it might well be that there are no one, there is no one who's not a theologian. Because we all have some conception of what makes for a worthy life. What makes for, uh, what's worth desiring. What it means to be fully alive. Your way of answering those questions might be with reference to the market. So you might say that the only way that human beings can flourish is through the uh, unregulated uh, competitive powers of the free market. That's what, so human flourishing will will arise uh, when we all, each of us, maximize our pursuit of our own self-interest and then somehow magically the the collective good will emerge. <clears throat> this actually seems to be a conviction that many people have. I would call that a theology, right? So, do you understand that theology is this broad work of seeking orientation and figuring out how to live a worthy life? Christians do that particular pr- task in reference to the divine life. And So we think there is an ultimate, and that ultimate reality is not the market, but the divine. And so we try to think theologically in reference to life as as it's lived in this comprehensive frame. Where are we? But with reference to the divine life and the intentions of God for the world. (coughs) That's theology. Eco-theology, then, is doing all that work of finding orientation, but by reference to the fact that we live within a comprehensive natural world and that we cannot actually think well about God's intentions for us apart from thinking about the natural world. One of the earliest statements of the uh, church fathers is that the glory of God is every creature fully alive. That's Irenaeus. The glory of God is every creature fully alive. Okay, let's let's start thinking eco-theologically from there. How is it possible to be fully alive if we're breathing in poisoned air, right? If, If we are natural beings and God desires us to be fully alive, surely God cares about the conditions that make for the fullness of life. So, already, 
at the very root of a fundamental theological claim, with just a little bit of attention, one realizes, ah, right, there are profound implications for thinking about who we are, where we are, and how we should live if we remember that we are also natural creatures. So ecotheology is, is theological thinking that tries to take into account our situatedness within a broad natural community. All right, clear on all that? All right, now let's dive into some of the, some of the uh, quotes many of you have in your hand, uh, handouts, which, and I'll, I'll, I'll be going through that. In every case, what I'll be doing is not so much conveying information as inviting you to do the kind of theological thinking I've just spoken of. So I begin with a quotation on eco-grief uh, as a problem in, in, in Canada. So this is from the Ottawa Citizen. And I... Uh, the link is there, so I hope you go read the entire article. It's actually really lovely and very thoughtfully done. It's a nice piece. So the piece says, Canadians are increasingly showing symptoms of anxiety, ecological grief, and even post-traumatic stress related to the effects of climate change. The impact of climate change on mental health is something researchers have only recently begun to study and evidence is beginning to mount. It is part of understanding a changing climate as a looming public health crisis. Food insecurity, post-traumatic stress disorder, population displacement, trauma, cardiorespiratory impacts, and even deaths because of wildfires, floods, storms, and heat waves, and related poor air quality are some of the health concerns felt in Canada in just the few months, past few months alone. So, uh, read that article because this article names that if we're going to think about God and the natural world, we ought to think from our context. Right? This is the context for our, uh, for our thinking. Of course, what the article leaves out and what many theologians, particularly those who call themselves liberation theologians or eco-liberation theologians would say is that these, these consequences don't affect us all equally. Right? <clears throat> the, for example, air quality is markedly different, certainly in my um, home country of the US, depending on uh, where the factories are located and where your communities are permitted to live. So the long history of racism in the US means that poor air quality affects African-American communities far more disproportionately than it does white communities. So, so context, theology always, um, I think, at its best, begins by naming the context from which we do our thinking, rather than older styles of theology that might start top down. What does a certain papal encyclical say? Right? What is the Nicene Creed say? Right? Rather than beginning from some far removed or abstract set of propositions, I think theology operates best when it begins from below. <clears throat> and this is what it means, this is what it looks like to begin from below, to name the concrete situations that need addressing, that call us to think about the divine life and its bearing on us. So let's keep that in mind as how we uh, as a desirable mode of doing theological reflection. Now, one way of telling the story of the development of eco-theology is to name a, 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 a about four-page article uh, that was published not by a theologian, but by a historian of science named Lynn White, Jr. In 1967, he published a piece um, called The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. That piece um, might be said to have woken Christian theologians 
from their dogmatic slumbers. Uh, to, to use a phrase used uh, earlier of uh, the work of Hume. So, Lynn White Jr. said Christianity is to blame for the mess that we are in. And he made two kinds of arguments, and I've, um, I've isolated those two here. One is that he made the claim that Christianity is fundamentally anthropocentric, cares about human beings, and doesn't care about the rest of creation. And this is quite contrary to earlier modes of religious life in which everything in nature was seen to be in some way uh, filled with the sacred. So uh, Christianity, by contrast, has eviscerated or removed the sacred from the world and placed it elsewhere in a transcendent remove. So that's the two sort of basic arguments he makes. And take, take a look. We don't have to read every line, but we can take a quick peek. In sharp contrast to Greek thought, um, Christianity inherits, he says, from Judaism, not only a concept of time as non-repetitive and linear, but also a striking story of creation. And what is that story of creation? Fundamentally one in which the human is established as having dominance over all of the rest of creation. That's part of the problem. Although man's body, uh, and again, he's writing the 60s, so the gendered language is why that's there. And of course, uh, eco-feminists would say, yeah, that's actually probably not a bad thing. And although man's body is made of clay, he is not simply part of nature, he is made in God's image. Especially in its Western form, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever seen. You can imagine how theologians reading something like that would say, hmm, I better get busy. <laughs> I better figure out if this charge is valid, and if so, what to do about it. The most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. As early as the second century, both Tertullian and St. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyons were insisting that when God shaped Adam, he was foreshadowing the image of the incarnate Christ, the second Adam. Man shares in great measure God's transcendence of nature. Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religions, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it's God's will that man exploit nature for its proper ends. How does one go about working theologically with that? accusation, that charge. One does excavation, right? One starts thinking, okay, now is that true? Is that a fair reading of scripture? Is that a fair reading of tradition? <clears throat> How uh, could such a conception about the Christian tradition have come to seem plausible to a distinguished intellectual like Lynn White, right? Is there a firm basis in this charge? And if so, what do we do about it? Do you see that? Those are all robust, difficult theological questions. I'm not so much interested in prescribing answers to you as to invite you to take up just those sorts of questions. Right? If I were to set out, well, first of all, do I agree? <laughs> if I agree, if I agree that this charge is actually accurate, would I then have to leave the tradition? Do you see what I mean? I mean, if it is thoroughly and irredeemably anthropocentric, we got some problems, right? So uh, that is a decision that faithful people have to make. Now, presumably, most of us are here because we think, I hope, that uh, our tradition is not irredeemably anthropocentric, and that even the strands within the tradition that are anthropocentric can be reconstituted, reconfigured, reshaped by our creative and faithful reflection. You see how theology then becomes a task, a project? Um, so that's the kind of thinking that, that eco-theology seeks to do. It seeks to say, well, okay, um, 
What is the human relationship to God and nature? What does the word Adam mean? Right. We go back to the scriptures. Turns out that the word Adam, Adama, means from the soil. Right? It might be translated as earth creature or earthling, although earthling sounds a little sci-fi-ish. <clears throat> so already we begin to go back to the text and, and excavate possible resources for reimagining the tradition. Second part of that charge he makes. In antiquity, every tree, every spring, every stream, every hill had its own genius loci its guardian spirit. These spirits were accessible to human beings, but were unlike human beings. Centaurs, fawns, and mermaids show their ambivalence. Before one cut a tree, mined a mountain, or dammed a brook, it was important to placate the spirit in charge of that particular situation and to keep it placated. Here's the key charge. By destroying pagan animism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. The spirits and natural objects which formerly had protected nature from man evaporated. Man's effective monopoly on spirit in this world was confirmed and the old inhibitions to the exploitation of nature crumbled. Fascinating charge. Fascinating charge. Is it accurate? Well, that's, theology has to do historical work to see if that's actually in fact true. So some of what theology, eco-theologians do is to say, really? Really? Was it that simple? Was there a clear sort of cut between ancient animism, which, it, which it imagined an anima, a soul, as infusing all things? And, um, and, and then there was this break, a radical rupture, and now it Within Christianity, the only anima or animated creature is moi, us, right? Uh, if you agree with that charge, then again, we have some problems with respect to being Christian. But is it true that Christianity and Christians are obligated to believe that there isn't uh, a spirit that infuses all things? Really? Isn't the Holy Spirit called the spirit of life? Doesn't the scripture begin with the Holy Spirit brooding over creation? Right? So you see that the charge is really not so much a question of historical accuracy, but it should serve to motivate us to do the investigation, to do the kind of thinking that will extricate us from this predicament. So anyway, Lynn White's essay, all four pages of it, has had more impact, I think, than uh, many a learned tome of 600 pages because it prompted us to revisit these, these questions. <clears throat> I myself do not believe in the accuracy of his charges. I am with my friend Akhil Bilgrami, who I quote next. <clears throat> Bilgrami says the the real change happened not uh, with the coming of Christianity itself, but with the emergence of early modern Christianity. And uh, Bill Grammy teaches, is a, is a distinguished philosopher at Columbia University. Uh, he and I are making plans to teach a course on, on Gandhi together. He is on Gandhi. Um, he is one of the world's premier experts on Gandhi. He's a capacious intellectual. And he argues that the fault lies, I'm sorry to say this, don't tell anyone, in part with us Anglicans. <laughs> we don't have to like, make that broadly known. To desacralize nature and matter was to exile God from the world, something essential to the official Newtonianism of the Royal Society in England. And he argues that the Anglican Church was fully on board with this. Where God was responsible for motion, not by being present in nature and thereby providing an inner source of dynamism that made for the motion of the universe, but as a clockwinder 
an external source of motion of an otherwise intrinsically brute and inertial universe. And this in turn had the consequence that now God, no longer present in matter and nature, was not available to all who inhabit God's world. God was a distant and providential figure and access to God was the exclusive prerogative, uh, prerogative of, scripturally, of the scripturally learned in universities. This complaint of the radical Puritan dissenter should not be confused. Anyway, let me uh, stop right there and say, uh, explain a bit of what this, what's going on here. Do you see what he's saying? It's when we stopped reading nature as itself sacred and infused with the divine life and began to see nature as mechanism rather than as living organism. That's when the rupture happened, not foundationally in scripture, not in the medieval period, not in the early church. In all of those moments, God was understood to be imminent and infusing all of nature. So even if we might not have been animists in, 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 uh, um, in, in the technical sense of pre-Christian re pagan religions, we were thoroughly within a frame of viewing the world as infused with sacrality. And Akhil is saying that the, the dissenters, the diggers, the levelers, all of them had a profound sense of nature as infused with the sacred. But starting with the Royal Astronomical Society and its Newtonianism, nature began to be seen as mechanism, as a clockwork, right? And what, what is God's role in, the, in, in a clockwork universe? Getting it going extrinsically, right? Winds it up, leaves it to be, and takes a long holiday. <clears throat> That is precisely what is uh, the problem. And Akil says, it was at that moment we moved from thinking about nature as sacred to nature as natural resources. <clears throat> and that's the, the historical charge that um, Akil makes. And I think he's got a very persuasive case. Read his very large tome secularism, identity, and enchantment. We lost a sense of nature as enchanted. And nature was disenchanted. Now, again, I'm not invested in making a historical argument. I am interested in getting us to think theologically about this proposition. If Akhil G is right, we already we add G in India to to respected figures, names, like Mahatma Ji. If Akhil Ji is right, the problem lies in converting nature into natural resources. That becomes a primary cast of mind for us. When, so when did that happen? We can debate that. But did that happen? It's hard to debate that, right? That for many of us, uh, nature is understood not to be infused with divinity, but as uh, where we go to extract natural resources. It has no value intrinsically. The value it has comes to it by the valuer. And the only person who does valuing is we ourselves. So the notion of intrinsic value, sacral value, is, uh, was, was removed from a mechanistic clockwork universe. There's a question that's, you, you can't keep it, you just keep it in, so. All of which also happened at roughly this time. That's right. I, I think there are consequences that extend. Right. And absolutely. I think you're 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 naming a larger 
set of transformations and disfigurations that affected not just nature. But here, Achilles naming, among other things, very real material things like the fact that in uh, Britain, the commons were dispersed, right? And land was privatized, right? We, we no longer had access to land. And that was part of the larger processes of uh, removing people from land and their, able, their uh, capacity to make their uh, own living and livelihood from the earth to, of course, the factory. So there's a number of uh, transformations that are happening now, but all of which um, are intimately connected to a desacralizing and a disenchantment of nature. So eco-theology is very much concerned to ask the question then, on what theological grounds might we re-enchant nature? Right? Um, and will that re-enchantment require seeing nature itself as sacred? Or is that not necessary? There are debates about this within theological quarters. Some say it doesn't really, you don't have to see nature as sacred in order to take care of it. Right, so certain kinds of evangelical theologies will say a good theology of stewardship is all we need. Right, God has placed us as stewards over creation. It's important, it's beautiful, it may be precious, but it need not be sacred for us to care for it. Others say, no, no, no. Uh, if, if this is the root diagnosis of the problem, then we ought to be aware that uh, it's the desacralization that led to this predicament in the first place. We do need to see it as sacred, even if not in the same way that the divine itself is sacred. Right? So all of those questions are debated in eco-theology, and we should, uh, we should fuss about that together <laughs> during the discussion period. Another problem that eco-theologians have named um, is the prioritization, prioritization of history over nature. Um, in Christian thought and theology. When Christians look to see God's presence, where do they go? Do we go to nature or do we go to history? Right? The charge raised by num a number of figures is that this is another part of the problem. That nature becomes the stage on which the play of history happens. And we look for God's agency in history and not in nature. We have stopped reading the book of nature. Right? And we've only read the book of history. That didn't, that didn't just, uh, that wasn't uh, that hasn't always been the case, right? In the early church, in the medieval church, it was routinely spoken of that every Christian is a reader of two books, the book of scripture and the book of nature, right? In early modernity, I think about the time that Akil names, we stopped reading the book of nature, other than as uh, thinking God's thoughts after him, to use Einstein's phrase, but in the case, uh, in, before Einstein, in Newton, uh, reading nature as mechanism rather than as vital organism. So we put it aside. We placed God outside the system and we stopped reading the book of nature and we looked for God's actions in history. And you see this sort of thing in such eminent theologians as Rudolf Bultmann, one of the great theologians of the 20th century. Our relationship to history is wholly different from our relationship to nature. Again, the anthropocentric language. Man, if he rightly understands himself, differentiates himself from nature. When he observes nature, he perceives there, he perceives there is something objective which he is not himself. When he turns his attention to history, however, he must admit himself to be a part of history. He is considering a living complex of events in which he is in essentially involved. He cannot observe this complex objectively as he can observe natural phenomena. For in every word which he says about history, he is saying something. He's saying at the same time something about himself. Friends, 
much of 20th century theology read like this. Uh, and prior to the 1960s with the work of uh, Jürgen Moltmann and ecofeminist theologians like Ra Rosemary Radford Ruther, John Cobb, and the beginning of process theology, before these 20th century, late 20th century developments, there was, I would say, even a kind of nature phobia in Christian theology. And I might say that it was not unrelated to uh, the Nazi phenomena, right? With its celebration of blood and soil, right? So some of the Protestant theologians who opposed the Nazis uh, said, see, that's the problem, right? And so Boltmann's writing within that broader context. So I understand why a certain kind of celebration of blood and soil by the Nazis might uh, make us a little nervous, uh, and not to, but the overreaction and the assumption that history is where we see God is um, a real problem that afflicted Christian theology in the 20th century until the eco-theologians came along. That's one of the course corrections that eco-theologians are trying to, to, to uh, make. What other course corrections are eco-theologians trying to make? Soteriology, fancy word. Uh, soteriology is the study of how we are saved, right? That, that is the branch of Christian theology that works on questions of salvation. <clears throat> a major charge that eco-theologians make, and I think this one's right, um, is that a great deal of Christian theology assumes that what God has done in Christ, God does for human beings and no one else. I mean, after all, who are sinners? We, right? And God comes to save human beings from sin, and the incarnation has no reference to the natural world. So um, that becomes a major charge. Right? So take a look at how this is put in uh, the words of Elizabeth Johnson. By the way, if I were to say, John, you know, Eco if, if you ask me, if the eco-theology literature is fast. You know, if I were to pick one theologian to spend my time working with, who, who should I pick? I might say there's a very good argument to go with Elizabeth Johnson, Catholic feminist eco-theologian who is just brilliant. I adore her and her work. And um, she, in a recent book, is looking at the whole notion of the cross and the way one particular theology of the cross has affected how we imagine what it means to be saved. Almost all Western theology assumes that Jesus Christ came to engage in a settlement of debt. You and I sinned against God. Big problem. If I sin against someone who is my peer, I can just go to my peer and say, I'm sorry. If I sin against my Lord, it's a landlord you know, in a medieval context, then I have a bigger problem because there's a, a debt owed to the person who is above me. When I offend God, I incur an infinite debt that I cannot pay because I am finite. So how does a finite being pay an infinite debt? No way, unless the infinite enters the human condition, becomes incarnated, and pays the debt on our behalf. Right? And the blood shed on the cross, and the cross itself, is the payment for sins. So how are we saved? By the incarnation of Jesus. Not so much. The incarnation is there, but only so that he can die. Right? Because it's the death that settles the penalty. The bill due. So even the divine taking on flesh is on this account, not where the action is. Does that make sense? And the, but the eco-theologian says, wait, 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 wait a minute. Don't we believe in a tradition in which God 
became meat, right? Flesh, incarne, right? Carne, right? So God becomes the earth. Is this not where we ought to think about what it means to be saved? And didn't the early church fathers and mothers say rather clearly that when God took on flesh, God was taking on the whole of nature, right? So many Christian eco-theologians are saying that it would be better to, uh, to change an early formulation of the church. Athanasius said, God became human so that the human might become divine. God became human so that the human might become divine. Contemporary eco-theologians look to that passage and say, God became an earthling so that earthlings might become divine. Complete change of how we think about the imaginative frame of, of salvation. Right? God comes so that all the earth might be fully and abundantly alive. And so the incarnation is not just about human beings, but about the whole of materiality itself, right? So what does this mean for us? Well, I won't read you that long set of quotes from uh, Elizabeth Johnson, please do so. We, you and I, in our Christian lives, need to say, well, how, how can I move my own imagination and the imagination of my community away from debt settlement, right? How can I think differently about theology so that all I do isn't just focus on the cross? How, how is my piety going to be different, my prayer life, my practical life, my imaginative life going to be different if I think that what, what, what is saving about Christ is not just that he came to kicked off, <laughs> but that God took on material life and flesh. That is an eco-theological project. That's the kind of work that one has to do to imagine uh, our way into a more a thoughtful um, relationship to the earth. The last section of the, uh, the handout articulates a number of resources for doing this work, right? As strikingly, strikingly, even in Lynn White's four-page essay, he suggested that one possible resource for thinking about um, theological, theology differently is St. Francis. St. Francis. He proposed in that article that we might see St. Francis as a patron saint for ecologists. And that was brilliant, a brilliant move. Um, I, I, won't, I, won't, I feel I ought not to say too much about this because we have a St. Francis expert in the audience. And uh, Adela here, Reverend Adela will tell us far more than I could possibly say about this. She's written uh, a book about St. Francis. But you see that in the, in the canticle of the creatures, you find another imagination. Listen to this. Praise be you, my Lord, with, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness of you, most high one. Praise be to you, my Lord, through sister moon and stars. You, do you feel the discourse? This is not disenchanted discourse, right? This is not nature as brute stuff or matter in motion or mechanism or clockwork. It is animated sacred nature. And I, I dare say that, that we think of Francis as exceptional in part because we've entered into such a, a really problematic mechanistic conception of the universe, right? A pre-mechanistic conception of the universe is one in which we might see all of the earth as kin, sister water, brother fire. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think it's quite right to say that we, we, can, we can turn to St. Francis again and learn what, what it would be like to live within an enchanted frame. <clears throat> 
of nature. I also think that for all of us here, a precious document of immense importance is Laudato Si. Um, the, the, those are the two uh, first Latin words from um, the, the encyclical of Pope Francis on care for our common home. That document is priceless because it, it, it captures the spirit of St. Francis for our, our uh, contemporary time. I, th I, I find it wondrous that the Pope took on the name of Francis. And I think he knew what he was doing right, right at the beginning. I wouldn't even be surprised if he already had in mind something like the need for this encyclical at the very moment of the inception of his ministry as, as Pope. That document is um, a brilliant one because, among other things, St. Francis, as a Latin American Pope, combines two things that have long been separated, namely, the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. All right. There's a wonderful book by that name, by a liberation theologian named Leonardo Boff, The Cry of the Earth and the Cry of the Poor. And Boff's argument is, you cannot separate these two cries. Don't sever those two concerns. Not least because of how I began, right? Namely that not all of us are equally impacted by the, by the ecological crisis. The poor and the marginalized are affected to a degree that the privileged are not. The migration crisis at the U.S. border is in, is in considerable measure an ecological crisis. Food isn't growing. If you talk to some of, those, uh, some of those migrants at the border, they say we have left not just because of the instability caused by gangs and like, but we are unable to grow food now because the soil is being depleted and so forth. So the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor um, Francis says these two need to be united. So after decades of sort of marginalizing Latin American liberation theology in St. Francis, sorry, St. Francis, in, Pop, in Papa Francis, these two things are, uh, have been reunited. And listen to how this sounds, right? Channeling his namesake, he writes, this sister, Sister Earth, now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her, endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. Right? We, we own earth. We are not owned by earth. It exists as natural resources, going back to my earlier remarks, rather than as, as sacral, as enchanted, as full of the divine spirit. And as a result of this attitude of ownership, of lordship, we plunder her at will. Which is why now we find ourselves in a situation where the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. You see what I mean about the, the binding of the concerns of the poor and the concerns for the earth. So immense, immense importance there. And a last word. I am a theologian of religious diversity. It is becoming increasingly clear to eco-theologians that there is no responsible way to think creatively and well about eco-theology without learning from our indigenous brothers and sisters. It is in fact malpractice to think that theological work can be done responsibly, uh, as though one can plumb uh, Christian resources alone, as though God has only spoken to Christians. This is absurd. And so uh, a great many eco-theologians are saying that we need to apprentice ourselves to precisely those communities for whom nature never stopped being enchanted. For those for whom nature has never become merely natural resources, but has always remained gift. So on that front, I would commend you 
that, uh, to read the wonderful work of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is a treasure. It's the sort of, I don't know what, to, it's, it's the sort of text that invites a kind of contemplative reading because it, it just has enormous riches. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a, a, a plant biologist, specifically a bryologist. Her expertise is um, uh, mosses and sweet grasses. And uh, her long attention to, to these features of nature as a, as a biologist, but as an indigenous scientist, has led her to make an argument that we need to, to infuse a sacred imagination derived from her indigenous values together with the best of our scientific knowledge. That only when those two things are deeply woven together will we generate an ecological imagination adequate to the scale of the crisis we find ourselves in. So um, there's so much more to be said. Uh, we could talk and we will, but I, I, th I think I'll stop there and, and then we'll take our break and come back and chat more.